History is not a one-track street. History's paths are not predetermined. History develops out of configurations and decisions, interactions and coincidences. Nothing is without an alternative. Sometimes only seconds or millimeters determine the course of history. Give us the what-if question always has the potential to lead into paradise or into hell. For us to understand why things did happen, we have to ask why other things did not happen. The counterfactual method is not witchcraft. Ultimately, all historians use it. Some deliberately, some unknowingly, but all do use it. The quest for alternatives unlocks the past for us. In order to understand the meaning of counterfactual history, one needs to understand factual history first. A team of experts is conducting a history experiment on the Nazi regime. What would have happened if Hitler had won the Second World War? Well, if the Germans had won World War II, it would have been an extremely unattractive prospect. But how realistic was a German victory? And the other way around. What would have happened if Hitler had been killed? It was sheer coincidence that someone kicked the briefcase placed by Stauffenberg away because it was in their way. Pop culture is obsessed with the horrors of the Nazi era to this day. Is it because people are mesmerized by absolute evil? The crimes of National Socialism were so inconceivable that people were asking, how could something like this actually happen? Could the Nazis have dominated the world? And what would that mean for us today? Munich, November 8, 1923. The barely known politician Adolf Hitler, leader of a right-wing splinter party, wants to make history. The, the national revolution has begun. I will rule the German Reich. The government in Berlin has been overthrown. Hitler wants to seize power and shatter the detested Weimar Republic. The young state was a result of the lost First World War. Many blame the Republic for the defeat, and many mourn the Kaiser. Weimar's democracy was essentially an imposed system. It was a so-called change of regime, which the Americans had more or less demanded at the time as a requirement for peace talks with the Germans. Many Germans remain distant to democracy. Many are suffering from poverty and feel controlled by others. And for more than a few, the conservatives and the extreme right appear to be an alternative. Deep. Democratic parties were a minority from 1920 to 1933. That was a very shaky democracy. On November 9, 1923, in front of the Feldherrnhalle at the Odeon Square in Munich, a putsch attempt from the far right takes place. The Odeon, the Odeon Square is closed off by police at this point. Goering, Ludendorff, Hitler and Scheubner Richter, who was Hitler's advisor on foreign affairs at the time, are marching in the front row of the rebels. As the rebels are trying to break through the police cordon, shots ring out. Goering is wounded. Scheubner Richter gets killed. Strangely enough, Ludendorff and Hitler, who were marching in between these two, remain unharmed. After the putsch attempt, Hitler gets arrested and sentenced to five years in confinement in a fortress but the apparent defeat becomes a turning point for the NSDAP. Before 1923, Hitler was just a local figure in Bavaria. 
the trial after the putsch attempt in 1923 becomes his forum for self-portrayal in the courtroom. Very many people become aware of him only now. He pretends to be the redeemer and the savior of Germany. Hitler changes his strategy after having been released from prison. He seeks a coalition with the conservatives. He now wants to come to power legally. We will get the nation onto them. Then we will finally be able to build a new Germany together. In fact, without that democratic sham. <laughs> Hitler actually becomes Reich Chancellor on January 30th, 1933. Less than 10 years after the failed putsch, the Nazi speaker from Munich makes it all the way to the top of the state. The days of the Weimar Republic are numbered as a result. Hitler, Hitler had already announced in March of 1923 that he would arrange for the government of the Reich in Berlin to end up on the lampposts in front of the Reichstag. Barely in power, Hitler implements his threats. The Nazis abolish freedom and rights and persecute their enemies. The first and foremost object of their hatred are the Jews. Hitler is determined to lead the Reich into the next war with catastrophic consequences. But could things have turned out in a completely different way? Would the war have been avoided without the Nazi dictator? And what would have become of the Weimar Republic if, at the Putsch in 1923, a Bavarian police officer had aimed a few centimeters further to the left? Weimar had, kind of Weimar had no defects in its DNA. We should not belittle Weimar. It ultimately perished as a result of unforeseeable historical events. If the Republic had been granted more time, a democratic culture could have grown. Eventually, the economic consequences of the First World War would have been overcome. More and more people would have benefited from the economic recovery. Even the Autobahn would have existed without Hitler. The plans for it date back to the time of the Republic. The relationship with the World War enemies France and Britain would have normalized over time. Maybe Weimar would even have become the driving force of a European reconciliation. Would that have been the future of a Europe without Hitler? I think if Hitler had been killed in 1923 in the putsch attempt at the Feldernhalle, his party, the NSDAP, would probably have disintegrated or sunk into insignificance. But the crucial point for me is really that the crisis of the Weimar Republic would have arrived anyhow. There are simply very many people who are extremely unhappy with this new republic at the time. The flash in the pan of the Golden Twenties is over by 1929. The Great Depression spreads to the Weimar Republic in 1929. The results are catastrophic, unemployment, poverty, and hunger. The pressure on the unbeloved democracy is rising. The problem is that democratic parties don't come together, that they fight each other. That is what paves the way for extremists on the right and on the left. The communists reject the Weimar democracy as capitalist. They want a state based on the Soviet model. If, without Hitler, the NSDAP had not seized power in Germany, would the communists have taken over instead? It is not unlikely that the communists would have tried to also come to power in Germany, but it would have been very difficult. Democracy was under an enormous attack from both right and left, although in the end, the attack from the right was the considerably more dangerous one, because Germany as a country was already very advanced industrially. 
leading to a very strong middle class. The communist challenge only contributed to the middle class drifting towards the right. One cannot predict what could have come out of this, but it is very likely that the republic would have evolved into an authoritarian system. The cards were stacked against the first democracy on German soil. But without Hitler, the odds would have been much higher that a Second World War, and in particular the Holocaust, would not have taken place. The Second World War starts with the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. The Wehrmacht conquers half of Europe during the coming months. After the fall of France in June of 1940, Hitler is at the height of his power. The fall of France completely transforms the strategic situation. And what that does is give Germany many more options and give Britain fewer options. The Germans are allied to Italy, uh, they're allied to the Soviet Union, they're allied to Japan, uh, France has fallen, uh, the United States is neutral. It's very difficult at that point to actually see how the British thought they could win. Hitler is planning to strike the last opponent in Western Europe. The Luftwaffe is supposed to prepare the German invasion of the island. The so-called Battle of Britain is based on a double misjudgment. The British government thinks the Luftwaffe is a lot stronger than it is. The German government thinks the Royal Air Force is a lot weaker than it really is. And so the battle evolves. It begins on a more or less balanced footing, but it becomes apparent very, very quickly that Germany cannot handle the losses. The British aircraft industry is simply better positioned. They produce more airplanes in a shorter time. They have a multi-tiered pool of pilots they can fall back on. The Royal Air Force prevails indeed. Germany's plans for an invasion have failed as a result. Britain keeps its freedom. Churchill is triumphant, and Hitler faces his first defeat against the British of all people. Hitler's relationship to Britain was essentially a disappointed love. Hitler admired the British Empire, but he had no clue about British culture or about the British political elite. The dictator has to change his plans. The attack on the Soviet Union begins on June 22, 1941. The target, Moscow. Hitler is planning on a quick victory, but he is misjudging once again. By the end of August 1941, a lot of German uh, generals were aware that the war was slipping out of control on the Eastern Front. The attack on Moscow fails. And in December 1941, the Red Army strikes back. The defeat in Stalingrad one year later indicates the end of Hitler's conquest plans. But did the Germans have a chance to win the war? Would the Wehrmacht have been able to conquer Russia or defeat the British? What would have happened if the Germans had won the aerial battle against Britain? An American propaganda movie arriving in theaters in 1943 was meant to fuel enthusiasm for the war. It offers this scenario. The Germans cross over after the victorious aerial battle, conquer the island, and in the end, they seize London. What would have become of the capital and of Britain if the Nazi invasion in 1940 had been successful? Would Hitler have overpowered all of Europe? 
hätte er die Lufthoheit über England. If he had been able to obtain sovereignty over the British airspace, that would certainly have gotten him a huge increase in prestige. That would have meant the first realistic chance since 1066 to at least attack Britain, to actually start an invasion. I have serious doubts whether the so-called aerial battle could have been won by the German Luftwaffe. But let's simply assume that it had been like that. In that case, the invasion of Britain and the occupation of Britain would perhaps have been possible. There is at least some evidence how the relationship between Germans and the British would have developed under the swastika. For a tiny part of the empire is under temporary Nazi rule. In 1940, the Germans occupy the British Channel Islands Guernsey and Jersey after the victory over France. The Channel Islands were in a difficult situation. They are very small. Uh, there was, as it were, no, nowhere really to hide for the inhabitants, and they were militarily extraordinarily vulnerable. This is where Hitler wants to propagate a moderate German rulership. But the apparent idol disguises that National Socialism brings an era of terror to the Channel Islands. Jewish Britons are being persecuted. Neighbors are denouncing neighbors. Everyone else is losing freedoms and rights. Would the main island have faced the same fate as Guernsey and Jersey? Racist demagogues and supporters of fascism also existed in Britain at the time. Oswald Mosley is heading the anti-Jewish, anti-communist British Union of Fascists. Would the German occupiers have made a fascist like him governor of Britain if they had won? If they had uh, occupied Britain, they might have tried to create a sort of quizzling collaborationist government on the model of what they tried to do in, you know, Vichy France or in Norway. Doubtless some people would have served in it, but I'm not quite sure how many. Churchill would have continued the battle after an invasion of England. The Navy would have stayed intact and would have evacuated the government and its gold reserves to Canada, as well as the royal family. When France surrendered, the entire empire surrendered. I think there would not have been the same scenario in Britain. In my view, there would have been a strong resistance movement. And I also think it's worth bearing in mind that the Germans had this unerring capacity to create resistance. Britain would have continued the battle from the distant dominions, with enormous resources and a strong colonial army. Such a war would not have been what Hitler had in mind. The National Socialists were not at all interested in the West. Everything was always only about Lebensraum in the East. Hitler had mentioned this objective already in the 20s. He intended to extinguish the Russian culture to make room for a Germanized East. If we presume that the military campaign against Russia would have led to the occupation of Moscow and Leningrad, and that a German military border would now have been erected at the Ural, the question is, if the war would really have ended then. The organization of the East would again have come at the cost of massive fatalities, with the displacement of vast population groups and the perspective of a constantly bleeding border in the East, as it was called. So, a war that drags on until doomsday. Hitler wanted to establish his German colonial empire in Russia's vastness. The Lebensraum in the East was supposed to encompass a vast area from Arkhangelsk to the Caucasus. The plan was to settle up to 10 million German peasant warriors in fortified villages behind a military border, to breed a Germanic race, and to exploit the natural resources ruthlessly. These objectives are summarized today as the master plan for the East. Aside from producing food supplies, the East was supposed to become an inexhaustible resource for supplying coal, much-needed oil reserves, and iron ore. <laughs> 
These were supposed to secure Germany's global position of power. The Slavic population is simply regarded as a disposable quantity in this process. Around 14 million people are designated to be work slaves for exploitation in the Nazi colony. All others are awaiting an even worse fate. Wir we know, by and large, what the German occupation policy in the Soviet Union looked like, which was strongly shaped by racism. And we also know the majority of these plans, which amounted to the deportation of at least 30 million East European people. Most of them would most likely have died of exhaustion, hunger and the cold. That means that the execution of the master plan for the East would have ultimately amounted to another exponentiation of the Nazi victims. The genocide would not have only affected the Jews, but everyone standing in the way of the Germanization. Hitler's conquest plans are among the darkest scenarios of contrafactual history. It would be foolish to assume that history only exists in the works of historians. History is part of pop culture. History has taken on a life of its own there. Or, let's say, the approach to history, the alienation of history. The Nazi world domination is a favorite subject of pop culture. Why is this fictional scenario still so fascinating today? In computer games, for example. Many people want to be engaged in this because they simply cannot understand it. How could something like this happen? They really delve into it. And that, of course, also includes the scenario, what would have happened if this had progressed further? I know this sounds absurd, but what if Hitler had won the war? What would the world look like today? I'm asked that question very, very often by you. As Mr. Knowledge to go, Mirko Drochman addresses this subject as well, successfully. The feedback was huge. I had been on holidays and I did not expect that this many people would watch the video. And all of a sudden, after one day, I had a million clicks or so. So-called reenactors recreate history themselves. The Second World War is a big topic, especially in the United States. The weekend warriors are staging historic battles during their gatherings in front of a huge audience. I think it is an important aspect to make history attractive for people and to show them, okay, history has happened and it is a thing of the past, but you can still engage with it and debate it. And it is important to understand history in order to understand the present. Since the 60s, movies and books made in Britain addressed the question what a life under German rulership would have looked like. The novel Fatherland was translated into 30 languages and sold more than 6 million copies. It appeals to a lot of people to play through that counterfactual. And obviously, World War II was important in the making of the modern age. And therefore, it is understandable that people wish to play through it. But movies on Nazi world domination, like The Man in the High Castle, are also being criticized for making light of its terror. Is that a valid objection? I believe. I believe programs, videos, books, and movies that assume that Hitler would have won the war do not lead to making light of it, at least if the movies are designed in such a way that they are realistic. If movies point out what really would have happened if the terror had continued, then I think that creates more of an awareness, namely an awareness that such a period could start again at any moment. Other movies, like Iron Sky, are exaggerating the Nazi myths excessively and ridicule them that way. This is a path that historians don't want to follow. The alternative, Daphne, the alternative should never degenerate into disrespect for the victims. The alternative has to always build on what actually did happen. Once the alternative becomes mere entertainment, it becomes irrelevant for historians, and it must allow itself to be questioned about what its actual objectives are. Normandy, June 6, 1944. The Western Allies are charging the Atlantic Wall built by the Nazis. 
At the same time, the Soviets are starting a large-scale offensive and are chasing the Wehrmacht. The Germans were slowly but steadily retreating since Stalingrad. The defeat in the East was basically predictable. A group of members of the resistance around Oberst Klaus Schenk Graf von Stauffenberg is determined to act now. They want to kill Hitler with a bomb. On July 20th, 1944, the assassin's plan is put into action. It was a very close call. It was really completely random. Stauffenberg had brought his bomb in a briefcase and put it on that side of the table where Hitler was standing, in this hut where they had a briefing. And then he left. And then another attendee of the meeting moved that briefcase to the other side of the heavy oak table base. At 12.42 p.m., the bomb tears up the meeting room. But Hitler survives the attack. The Führer visits staff and the members of the Wehrmacht commander who were injured in the attack in the hospital. The Nazi propaganda celebrates Hitler's survival as a miracle. The assassins, however, are being persecuted relentlessly. Stauffenberg is promptly executed on July 20th at nighttime. Hitler's revenge in the next couple of months will be the deaths of many more men. That was a very important point for all to no longer participate, and they knew that they were on the brink of death. Hitler's war continues. Millions of soldiers and civilians will die. Countless cities will be reduced to piles of rubble and ash. The murderous pogrom of the Nazis also continues in the death camps. Before Berlin is captured by the Russians, another nine long months go by. But what would have happened if Stauffenberg's bomb had killed Hitler on July 20th? What would have happened next in Germany and at the front after July 21st, 1944? A civil war would probably have been the consequence. The Nazis would have brutally fought back. Goering and Himmler were the ones who acted, and they organized the crushing of the resistance with the help of Goebbels, who was in Berlin. He initiated the appropriate propaganda right away. This scenario would have applied in the same way if Hitler had no longer been alive. Goering had been Hitler's substitute for a long time. Himmler is in command of the police and of the almost 600,000 men in the Waffen-SS. And Goebbels is controlling the media and the whole propaganda machine a powerful alliance. These Nazis would probably have continued to fight until the end, even without Hitler, and with similarly destructive results. But what would have happened if the opponents of the Nazis had prevailed? The hope of the uh, plotters appears to have been that it would be possible to negotiate an end to the war with Britain and the United States, but not with the Soviet Union, and that would have reset the sides as well. The new government would probably also have continued the war, but perhaps they would have redeployed all forces towards the east to stop the advancing of the Soviets. That would have opened up the Reich to the Americans. Maybe then they would have been the first ones to reach Berlin. But would the Western Allies also have been willing to join forces with the Germans against the Russians, just as the conspirators were hoping? <laughs> <laughs> 
If the Putschists really had succeeded in seizing the governmental power, then that would have led to a quicker end of the war. I think that the Allies would still have insisted on an unconditional surrender, but maybe they would have been open to some concessions for the time after the war. Churchill was also simply not particularly interested in letting Stalin advance further west. That is certainly right, and that is what the conspirators would have tried to exploit first, by making such offers to the Allies, to the Western Allies, the British and the Americans, to join forces with them, to fight together against the Russians, but certainly that was absolutely inconceivable for the Western Allies. The Allies would also have demanded an unconditional surrender from the Nazi opponents. When they really freedom, if they really wanted peace, they had to agree to this demand. They would have had to accept that the alliance between the Soviet Union and the Western powers could not be broken apart. An earlier end to the war would nevertheless have saved countless lives. Many cities would not have been destroyed. And the Holocaust would have been brought to an earlier end. Stauffenberg was highly motivated to assassinate Hitler because he had witnessed the extermination actions in the East, the mass murder that had taken place there. In order to put an end to these massive crimes against humanity, the members of the resistance risked everything. The opposition against Hitler and also those people who ultimately prepared the assassination were incredibly courageous. They had certainly realized that they would lose their lives, that their families were also in jeopardy because the Nazis applied collective punishment. That's why one cannot recognize highly enough what these people did back then, during this infamous dictatorship. In Germany's darkest hour, Stauffenberg and his comrades proved that resistance was possible. August 29, 1944. U.S. forces are celebrating the liberation of Paris with a parade. The cheering is immeasurable. The ultimate defeat of Nazi Germany seems to be simply a matter of time. Hitler is hoping for his last trump card, wonder weapons. Some are still being built, like the England Kanone. Some are being tested, like a new type of submarine. Some are already being used like a jet fighter. Would these weapons be able to turn things around? Hitler was very interested in wonder weapons. And he was interested in them in all forms, uh, at sea, in the air, and on land. Um, a lot of the resulting investment and effort was completely misapplied in the sense that um, it would have been better off continuing existing marks and keeping them in, you know, in production, rather than trying to put quite a bit of effort into things that didn't work or that worked only so well. It is one weapon in particular that is fueling the hopes of the Nazi regime. The first functioning large missile ever, called Vergeltungswaffe II by Goebbels, V2 for short. Technologically impressive, but useless in the military. Thousands of concentration camp prisoners and civilians lose their lives in its production and deployment. But the missile is unable to change the course of the war. That would have been much more likely with another new weapon technology, the atomic bomb. After Otto Hahn's successful attempts with uranium, they realized quickly that atomic energy could be used for both peaceful and military purposes. From 1939 on, research is being done on this, at first in the Reich's education ministry, but then also in the Heereswaffenamt. So they think of the bomb quite quickly. The problem is twofold. 
For one thing, there are authority battles between the scientists and the participating institutions. On the other hand, the resources needed for the bomb were not available in sufficient quantities. No enriched uranium and no heavy water. And kein schweres Wasser. But what would have been the prerequisite necessary to turn Nazi Germany into a nuclear power during the Second World War? The National Socialists should not have persecuted and ousted Jewish and social democratic physicists. The National Socialists should have treated the remaining scientists much differently. National Socialism was a populist, a non-academic ideology. The National Socialists should actually not have been ruthlessly anti-Semitic. They should not have been ruthlessly anti-intellectual. They should technically not have been Nazis. Then they might have succeeded to have an atomic bomb built. It is different in the USA. Since 1942, the building of the bomb is expedited through the Manhattan Project. The first atomic bomb detonates on July 16, 1945. It is much harder to weaponize an atomic bomb than most people seem to imagine. Otherwise, most terrorist groups would be doing it at the moment. So it's not so much the question of working out how to get it to work, it's the question of how to use it in a weapon and a weapon delivery system. Less than three weeks after a successful trial, a US bomber takes off from the Pacific island Tinian. Its destination, Hiroshima. On August 6, 1945, the atomic bomb explodes 600 meters above the city. It kills 70,000 people immediately. Up to 150,000 die from the consequences. Three days later, another bomb falls on Nagasaki. Japan surrenders. The biggest bloodshed in history is over. Is another end to the Second World War imaginable? What if, against all odds, not the USA, but Nazi Germany had built the atomic bomb? Ever since Hitler declared war on the USA at the end of 1941, he has been dreaming about attacking the American East Coast. What if the Germans had dropped an atomic bomb over New York City in 1945? Would Hitler have won the war at the 11th hour? Or would everything have unfolded quite differently? This would have happened if the Germans had um use the atomic bomb, the Allies would have bombed the hell out of Germany. I think that it would not have changed the war. I think it would have definitely escalated uh, the anti-societal aspects of it. The nightmare scenario of a German-Japanese world domination, however, was never a serious option. There were actually Nazis in the USA, Americans of German descent who sympathized with the Nazi regime. But capturing America and a Nazi world domination remain a pure fantasy. Just like the capital of the world empire, Germania, which Hitler planned to construct in Berlin after the ultimate victory. Today's Berlin is a cosmopolitan and vibrant metropolis. But let us continue our thought experiment. What would our present age have looked like under the National Socialists? Assuming that the National Socialists had won this war against all odds, then I can very well imagine that their regime would have lasted for a very long time. It would have been awfully dark, horrendous. And I am honestly afraid that this reign of terror would not have been terminated after a few decades. Well, first of all, I share your horror scenario of a Nazi regime that is now lashing out fiercely and without restraint. 
but I think that its energy would have fizzled out after a few years. Big surges of violence would probably have failed to materialize. The system as such would have stayed intact, just like the Soviet system stayed intact after the end of the Stalin regime. The Soviet Union wins in the Second World War under Stalin. After the dictator's death, the system continues to exist for decades. But oppression and inefficiency are paralyzing the great power until its collapse. Would the totalitarian Third Reich have met a similar fate after Hitler's death? At the very least, there is hope that a Nazi world power would have collapsed sooner or later because of their internal conflicts and their own destructiveness. The what-if question casts a new light on Hitler and his war. Some myths about the Third Reich fall by the wayside in the process. I don't think that the counterfactual scenario in, enables one to see the Germans winning World War II. They had a dysfunctional political system, um, the multiple uh, agencies of central government within the state. There is a high level of incompetence dressing up in, you know, fancy uniforms. Neither a victory in Europe nor world domination are realistic under Hitler. For that, the Nazi regime is too irrational and too inhumane. But the thought experiment of a German victory leads to another important finding. When we remember the dictatorship, we realize the importance of dialogue. When we remember the dictatorship, we realize the importance of fundamental rights, the freedoms that we are so used to now, on which we don't reflect enough. Even Hitler's slaying would not have completely altered the course of history. But this scenario opens up new perspectives too. The image of National Socialism is now one of absolute evil. And of course, no one wants to have anything to do with absolute evil. No one wants to picture that oneself or one's family has taken part in it. But someone's own family did participate. And if one were to live in that time or in a similar time again, then one would have to make these very same decisions that people at the time had to make. Counterfactual questions about the Nazi Reich and an alternative course of history show that the past is not a thing of the past yet. History is essentially always rewritten. Interpreting history is nothing static. There is no such thing as researched fully. Every generation rewrites history. Time and time again, that applies especially to the question, what if? <laughs>